Latinos are likely to be the largest racial or ethnic minority bloc in the 2020 election. They are also sitting at the nexus of so many issues on the ballot, jobs, immigration, health care. The easy answer is Latinos mostly support Democrats. But new research from Equis Labs reveals there are no easy answers. Things are a bit more complicated than that. And Equis Labs co-founder and president Stephanie Valencia has described Latinos as the X factor in American politics and society. She's here to tell us why she says that and what this new research reveals. Stephanie, thanks for being back here at Hill TV. Thank you for having me. So good to see you. Yeah. Okay, so you guys did a lot of research. 8,100 surveyed people out there. Right. And you were in 11 states. Right. What did you learn? So there's some really interesting findings uh, when we survey a universe that large. I think one of the things that we've seen is there are some uh, broad misconceptions about the Latino community that you alluded to in your intro, and we have not really taken the time or invested the resources to do a really deep dive in the Latino community. And now is really the time to do it because heading into the 2020 election, 32 million Latinos will be eligible to vote. Um, we've seen- their 32 million. 32 million. We will be the largest uh, uh, minority eligible voting bloc uh, in the country this year. And so what is interesting about that is that there's a lot of nuance to that. Um, in the 11 states we pulled, we saw places where we saw a lot of similarities, places where we saw some differences, and we'll get into that in a minute. But we know that Latinos are poised to really influence this election. They will be the sex factor in places that are traditional battleground states like New Mexico, Colorado, Nevada that have slowly started to turn blue, um, but emerging battleground states like Arizona and Texas. And then the battleground states where we have a small but rapidly growing population like Michigan, Wisconsin, yeah. and North Carolina. And then, of course, Florida, which hashtag is always complicated um, and is very nuanced, right? Um, but some of the things we saw across all 11 states, gender and age were really important breaking points. The younger voters are much more progressive. Uh, you know, women are a lot more progressive than their male counterparts. Um, the gender gap across all 11 states is greater two to three times greater than white and African American, that white and African American gender, gra gender gap. And so that presents a really interesting um, question around um, as we start to think about people we need to start communicating with earlier in the uh, election cycle, who we need to start communicating with now. Um, the last thing I would just say in one of our key findings was a gap between motivation and excitement, which mm. we definitely want to keep a pulse on. In some places, anywhere from 20 to 30 points, that gap between motivation and excitement. And what that means is people are you know, motivated around issues involved in the election or they're watching the election, but they're not yet excited to vote. And that could be for a lot of reasons, right? One, you know, there's not really a Democratic nominee to compare Donald Trump to. And so maybe they're just not excited about who they are going to have to vote for. And or, and or it could potentially be that some of the negative rhetoric that we have been hearing from Donald Trump and Republicans for a very long time is starting to have a, a more um, sizable impact on enthusiasm. And so it's this kind of is another voter suppression tactic, tactic perhaps. Uh, exactly. And so this is, uh, you know, we're not just doing this particular survey this summer. That's what's really different about this project and what makes it so groundbreaking is that we're making a long term commitment to tracking sentiment both political sentiment and identity sentiment from this community through 2020. So we will continue to do monthly trackers uh, within the community so we can start to see where these measures change okay. as big events happen. Okay, so let's get in here. I'm just going to yep. dig in here a little yep. bit. So uh, you talked about the, the gap between men and women, this yep. gender gap that you noticed that was happening across right. the country. Does that mean that Latino men are more likely to support President Trump uh, than not. Is, is it a majority of Latino men that support President Trump? So that is what we found in our study, which yeah. is not quite a majority. In, in some places, it is a majority in a place like Florida. In some places like Michigan, it's more nuanced and we can really hone in on a very specific part of the male population, which is middle-aged men uh, between 45 and 65. What's driving it? That's what I'm trying to get at. What's driving this? Right. You know, it's unclear. I think, you know, stuff around the economy um, is clearly a driver. Folks think that, you know, especially men think that he's more in control of the economy and are responding well and giving him high 
high marks for that. Um, what's interesting though is that we are seeing both on healthcare and immigration, and this is where we kind of see the swing in the other direction with women, um, they're judging him very harshly on immigration and healthcare. Um, and even within the economy and support on the economy, there's some softness. And so in places like Texas and North Carolina and Virginia, Trump is underperforming right now his 20, the 2016 exit polls among Latino voters. And I think you said among women, women, uh, Latina women are overperforming by 15 points over 2016 yes. toward the Democrats. Yes, and inside, that's across all 11 states, the average across and all And what's driving states. that, you think? I think his the, the rhetoric and tone that we are starting to see, especially on immigration, what we're seeing around taking people's health care away and continuing to make attempts to appeal, repeal Obamacare. Um, these are really kitchen table issues and issues that affect people's everyday lives. And I think women just have a, 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 a a more spidey sense for kind of hearing these things and really kind of connecting them back to Donald Trump. One issue that popped for me when I looked in the research was this idea of Medicare for all. Right. And I think you guys polled Medicare for all versus Obamacare. Yes. And it beat it by something like 20 points in some this places, This was right? really interesting. I think the high level takeaway from that is that one, people want access to quality, affordable health care for everybody. Um, there, I think one of the things we took away from that as well is branding matters. Medicare for all sounds like something that everybody is going to get. We didn't get into the details of, are you gonna have to give up your plan? Are you gonna be able to buy Medicare exchange, Medicare for all in the exchange, et cetera, et cetera. So it was just the bumper sticker. It was sticker. just a kind of the it bumper the, sticker yeah. of the brand. And now we are going to go back in you know, later this year to try to understand where the nuances are on the details, because obviously the details matter. But the simple branding, there was some drag from the term Obamacare. Um, so that was an interesting finding for us as well. Unfortunately, and I still believe that there were um, uh, forces within um, ICE and CBP um, who ultimately did not want to implement President Obama's agenda. We could have written uh, memos all day long trying to um, steer and guide better enforcement policies, but at the end of the day, when you aren't met with people on the other end who want to uh, enforce those in the way that we had intended, um, we ended up with a system that you know has now because Donald Trump is president and has emboldened many of those people uh, who are in immigra enforcing immigration law we ultimately have ended up in a place where uh, the system is out of control. And when you hear people talking about saying abolish ICE, what they're really meaning is we should end for profit, you know, and profiteering off of the immigration enforcement system and locking kids in cages and separating people from their families. We really do need to rethink fundamentally what does the immigration enforcement system look like from a practical perspective, who is benefiting from it, and how do we actually make it fair and clear for people people who want to come here legally. And how do we punish employers, like in the Mississippi raid, which was unconscionable to me that you would deport and round up and deport hundreds of hardworking immigrants who are literally doing the work that nobody else wants to do in this country, which is you know, doing the slaughtering of chicken and beef um, so that we can have it on our dinner tables, yet no employer was actually taken away in that same raid. Um, the same employers who hired those hundreds of undocumented workers. So yet there is no punishment for the people who are actually doing the hiring, yet we are rounding up and deporting people who are doing the work nobody else wants to do.